Oh, hi, Mengying. Hello, YZ. Welcome back again to PBS. <laughs> uh, today we are going to talk about experiments. Yes. Experiments. <laughs> and uh, that is the foundation of how we connected. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I think even before Notion uses static, which is the foundation, uh, we both work at Facebook. Yes. And uh, we saw a lot of experiments. Uh, so at your time at Facebook, how many experiments do you support every week? Oh, that's a great question. I remember when I first joined notification team, that was my first team while I was at Facebook. We run five to 10 experiments every month. How big is the team? The team had probably six engineers. So six engineers do five to 10 experiments per month. Yeah, at least. At yeah. least. Yeah. And then when you leave Facebook, you were supporting a six a data scientist. You have seen a spectrum for okay. you know, zero to one products, immature to mature products. Exactly. The overall tendency is mature products do more experiments. Yes, because when we, uh, when the product is more mature, uh, is one we're looking for more levels uh, for the optimizations, which we probably already exhausted all our ideas from in the beginning. Uh, and the second is we have just have a large sample size for astro experiments. Okay, I think there are both misconceptions or discussions on both sides. Yeah. One is the sample size, how large uh, do you need the sample size to be in order to run experiments. But even the first one, experimentations is only for optimization. And when you do experiments, you are basically, you don't have any idea, so try anything and see what moves up the metrics, and then you just uh, do that without understanding what caused uh, change. Is that true for mature products? I think that's the wrong way <laughs> to run experiments, in my opinion. I think for any experiments you are running, you should first have a hypothesis on mind. Mm -hmm. So what things you want to test, not random test, any random ideas I have. But you either have a strong intuition about, OK, I think this is user's pain point. I either I hear it anecdotally from Twitter, or I did some user research already, or I can get some evidence from the data, saying this is the, the pain point that we should focus on this one uh, to make future changes. But of course, it's all a hypothesis, right? So that's why I want to use experiments to and test. The well. hypothesis cannot be if I make this change, that metrics will go up. No. It has to be about why. It has to be about why, exactly. Because again, if you listen to our other episode, the metric is for measurement. Yeah. Yeah. Me uh, metrics is for the mission. Exactly. It's not just for, you know, metrics is not the goal. Exactly. Yes. Nice. I guess the wrong way of looking at experiments is experiments measures the, I don't know, the change. But really, experiments are about learning the whys. Exactly, it's about learning the whys to validate your hypothesis. Okay. But in reality, I think a lot of a common practice is people are happy if their uh, experiments are positive and uh, are unhappy if their experiments are insignificant or even a static uh, negative. Yeah, that's actually pretty common, I would mm. say. So I see, especially in the very beginning of using experiments to make product launch decisions. Engineers will be so frustrated if they spend, let's say, two weeks on a feature change, but it didn't end up with any kind of positive changes they would like to see. However, I think this is also a great learning for these engineers too, because again, while experiments is not about moving the metrics, it's about learning, it's about to validate the hypothesis or not, to validate whether the hypothesis is correct or not, right? So even if it's non-specific, we can still go in deeper to understand why, right? So what part of the hypothesis was wrong to begin with? And can we actually iterate on the non significant result to see what's the next step we can work on to improve this experience? The reality is common to focus on the static positive results. We should celebrate the learnings and we should learn from the insignificant or unexpected results. Yes. But in reality, how often does it happen? Or like uh, I think it has to do with the culture oh. as well. So if the data culture is, is built in a way that people understand experimentations are about learning and we need to utilize the evidence we see from the experiments to make a decision, I think that conversation is really more easier mm -hmm. than in a work, you know, 
all their performance review is based on you know how a metric has been moved in the experiments. I think that conversation is going to be a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. At least uh, a notion and the and Facebook uh, every team have been working on. I think people celebrate learnings more than anything. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, I think. It became less common at Facebook. Oh, really? But I'm glad that that uh, notion people still celebrate learnings. Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of things we just don't know, and we want to test it out. And that, that's why when we are evaluating teams, even at Facebook, we evaluate team both on their, you know, how much metric have been driven, their product impact, and also their execution,、mm. uh, which has something to do with, you know, whether they have a solid hypothesis, whether they execute very well, even the result is not as expected.、Mm -hmm. However, We're still going to reward them for that. Yeah. So it's more complicated, but it's the right thing to do. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I remember discussing with an MIT professor.、Mm -hmm. He is an engineering professor.、Mm -hmm. He talks about the experiments, and his observation is quite aligned with what, what we observe.、Mm -hmm. In Ronnie's book, Ronnie talks about ten to twenty percent of the experiments are expected.、Mm -hmm. The rest, eighty percent, is unexpected. Yes. Insignificant or. The other direction, exactly. Also, yeah, yeah. And I asked the MIT professor why,、mm -hmm. and he said it's normal because you are doing hard things.、Uh, when you do hard things, you, you cannot guarantee the result. Otherwise,、yeah, exactly. you have been doing easy things. If you do repetitive things, yeah, you know how it's going to turn out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Because we are doing hard things, it's more important to learn、uh, from the mistakes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's the only way to improve. Now,、I'll、go back to my second question: the sample size. But also, I think sample size is one of the many conditions of、mm -hmm. is experiment even feasible? Yes. So suppose, okay, everyone agrees, experiments. We should do experiments, but they only is too costly.、Uh, engineers don't have the bandwidth, or it's a luxury to have, or we are too small. Right, that, those are the common、uh, things when people think about、uh, before running experiments. So, can can you set up experiments even? Yeah,、uh, I think of course. You know, usually we need to have a certain sample size before we can run experiments. Because、uh, for anybody who's familiar with, with statistics, that's just as a foundation、uh, for any experiments, right? However, it's kind of hard to. I always get the questions. Oh, how many users I need to have in order to run experiments?、Uh, it's really hard to talk about this in a vacuum, because it's not only about the size itself, also about the sensitivity of the metrics, right?、Uh, the variability of the metrics. So, and so that's why it's gonna very dependent on individual team and individual product situation. And also the delta you create. Exactly, and also how much change you you want you, you expect. Mm -hmm. From from the, 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 this specific change, Tim actually has an article that he did the calculation. If you expect the delta is this much, then the sample size is only yeah exactly minimum sample size only that much yeah yeah okay. So the, I guess if your matrix is sensitive to experiments,、mm -hmm. and if your relative delta, expected rel relative delta is large,、mm -hmm. basically you are looking for large changes. Yes, you are looking for the over ten percent delta.、Yep. That you don't need to have millions of users. Yeah, exactly. You don't need to have Facebook scales of users in order to run experiments. Okay, you、yeah. can check out the blog for more details. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that is the message.、Yeah. Except for、uh, sample size, are there other、uh, considerations of、uh, can I run experiments? Yeah, I think there are other considerations when it comes to running experiments. Another thing is not every change needs to have experiment to begin with. Even you already satisfy all the criteria you just mentioned before.、Uh, so, for example, if we're just gonna do, just gonna make a bug fix, right? We know something is definitely broken. Why would we run an experiment to to, to see? Uh, how much leaf we're gonna see from the improve from the improved experience?、Oh. Because we just have to work on it. We actually have a different、uh, point of view. Oh,、uh, really? He, he thinks even as simple as a bug fix, you can do an experiment. Yeah, I think you just, can.、Yeah. But I'm not saying that's you. It basically, it's not very. It's not necessary, if that makes sense. I think、yeah. it's optional. It's optional. You know, for bug fix, definitely it's better to have experiment to understand. Okay, how how severe the Bug was right. I think his point is because of the feature flags, the experimentation is almost free. So there is no point of not doing it.、Mm. There is almost no downside. Basic two lines of code, and the upside is maybe you don't care about the metrics results,、mm. but you still want to see if the bug is fixed. Sometimes you fix the bug, but you don't actually know. Yeah, I see. That, that's that's the ideal world because of the systems. The cost of running experiments are low. Yeah, it's better to check. 
in scientific discoveries as well, right? If you can do an experiment, you do an experiment. Yeah, I think that's a good point because right now the way we are fixing bug is we always just eyeball it. Yeah. Basically, we just say, oh, we launch this feature, oh, is that experience fixed or not? Uh -huh. Maybe there are some kind of nuances, some niche yeah, cases. Yeah, maybe it increases latency by 50 percent. Uh, yeah, exactly. Then. Also, another thing is people rely on A/B testing a lot. They, they think A/B testing is a very powerful weapon mm -hmm. for you to understand whether the feature is going to work or not. But I also think there are some cases you kind of run A/B testing as you mentioned, because of some constraints of statistical considerations. There are also some constraints in terms of the uh, assumptions of A-B testing, right? Because randomization is a very, very important condition for you to run any A-B testing. But sometimes it's really hard to randomize your population. Yeah. So for example, if we want to uh, change um, the currency mm -hmm. uh, of our Pricing, it's going to be really hard to run an experiment within a country mm -hmm. because people will talk. Yeah, and uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be really tricky to navigate that PR situation. So, yeah. in case of that, for example, at Facebook, we did a pricing test, we had to use some country test. Yeah. So that is legal reasons, regulatory reasons, and the spillover effect. Exactly, spillover yeah. effect, exactly. But yeah, there are cases, you, for example, I work at Amazon, and it's just impossible to do center-side experiment yeah, exactly. because it's not legal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Facebook has some discussion about running a long-term holdout for advertisers mm. uh, to understand you know, the relationship between the early indicators and the revenue, yeah. but they called it out because of the PR yeah. issues. Yeah. Yeah, some some stuff can be fixed by uh, switchback testing. Sometimes synthetic control causal models. Yeah, exactly. Uh, those are the topics for later, for later. Uh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. they also have their own very nuanced uh, complications. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. What are the common mistakes? Suppose, okay, I decide, oh, I can run experiments, I should run experiments. Then what are the common mistakes I will make as newbies in experimentation? Yeah, I have actually seen a lot, especially when I first uh, joined Notion and engineers are very new to experiments. So a lot of people actually never run experiments before. There are two major categories of mistakes I've seen so far. One is about around experiment design and setup. The other is about measurement. Okay. In terms of design, I have seen a lot of engineers when they first start doing experiment, they are very excited and they want to, you know, launch their features as quickly. Mm -hmm. but that's why they want to bundle oh. a lot of features all together so that they, they hope that, you know, if we see a statistically significant re result, they can launch them all. You know, <laughs> instead of waiting for each individual features experiment. That is exactly the uh, mistake the MIT professor point out yeah. when they do engineering experiment. You'll be a PhD student about try to test five parameters at the same time. Exactly. Then even if it moves the results, you don't actually know. You learn nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that's the common mistake we see. For example, when you want to improve your onboarding experience for, for users, and then you change the order of the pages the user is going to encounter during the onboarding flow. You also change the options available to you to users to, to select. Then when, when some distribution shifted or the click-through cl changes, you don't know which part is going wrong. Yeah. Uh, in that situation, what you can do is have to start over again. <laughs> That's actually going to take even more time. Yeah. So, but in some uh, special s situations, you can actually change multiple features yeah. at the same time when they are bundled into one single experience. Yeah. Yeah. Some experience is a bundle of multiple features. Then, but uh, I think the the underlying principle is go back to your hypothesis. What is the hypothesis? If a hypothesis is about the experience A versus B, mm -hmm. and uh, the experience is a bundle of multiple features, then okay. But be very clear on your hypothesis, yes. on what you try to learn. I think you can avoid most of the mistake. Yes, You'll exactly. realize, oh, my experiment mm -hmm. cannot test whatever the, re just write out the re expected results. If the experiment increase, decrease, insignificant, what am, am I going to conclude about my uh, hypothesis? And you can find out, oh, I cannot mm -hmm. draw a conclusion and then go back and uh, change our experiment design. Yes, totally. And another common mistake we see in experimentation design is really around what unit do you want to use for your test? Because in some simple word, right, yeah. you just use user. That's yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. Or you have some web sessions you can run experiments from. Mm -hmm. 
However, in some complicated situations, for example, in Facebook groups, right, they have a group admin, they have group members, mm. they also have groups, especially for some features, you want to facilitate the conversations across group members, you need to use group ID instead yeah. of group member ID to yeah. avoid the speed over impact. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes when engineers set up experiments, they don't think very deeply in terms of whether should I use user or should I use group ID. Yeah, yeah, the unit, unit impact. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Another common mistake we see is the engineers tend to trigger the exposure too early in the user's journey because, for example, they might have run some experiments in after user just finished sign up. And then afterwards, in every single experiment they are running for new users, they are going to use that as a, as an exposure trigger. Mm -hmm. But however, if you run some experiments, some changes not directly after they sign up, but after they finish their onboarding flow, after they land into the product, you shouldn't use their sign up. It's because this is going to create dilution of the metric you have because you know the dynamic is going to be way higher and it's going to change the sensitivities of the metrics and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why we always recommend the engineers to expose the users as deep as possible. Yeah. So ideally right before the change is triggered for, for the new user. Yeah, that's, that, that, that is so intuitive, but I do see that mistakes as well. Uh, yeah, it's so convenient. You know, you can reuse what you had before. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but uh, then you reintroduce a lot of noise or just irrelevant data into a data set. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Another common mistakes I have seen so far is, you know, because right now most of the, the digital product have apps on both desktop and, and m mobile. And they also, m m like most of the products are international as well. Mm -hmm. It's not only within English ex like speaking countries, but also in other regions too. So sometimes we see engineers, when they think about long term feature, they didn't think about, you know, who are the target population for this feature? Is this feature going to be able to render properly on mobile? Have you done the localization of the language first before you decide to do a global test? Another mistake, you didn't really specify what kind of eligible trigger events for your product. Because the thing is, even for the same trigger, there might be several events locked in parallel for, like for, for different purpose. Uh, but sometimes if you don't specify what's the exact trigger events, you just, it's really hard for you to debug if something is, is going wrong. This is especially very common in kind of early stage startups because uh -huh. they tend to overlock a, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But so for people who don't, who are not familiar with trigger events, can you explain what they are? Yeah, so trigger events is an event when the user trigger that event, the exposure will be triggered which means that the user will be randomized into a test control group. And the test group will see the new change you want to apply to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the control group will see the, the current experience. Basically, it's the fork of exposure happens. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you need to specify the locking and trigger the assignment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So what is the example of not specified correctly? So I think some examples of why, and also want to why it's important to specify it correctly is because sometimes, you know, when you need to do some analysis, if, if we don't have the luxury to have static, for example, yeah. if we want to do some analysis, we need to understand, you know, which part we actually can use to divide the user to test and control groups. Mm -hmm. But if the engineer doesn't read very clear on, it's hard for data science to, to understand that part. Yeah. Yeah, you, you thought you are estimating one experience versus the another, maybe you are estimating completely. Exactly, right. exactly. So that's why we actually have an internal template within Notion yeah. uh, for everybody to, to fill in to make sure all these mistakes can be avoided uh, uh -huh. ahead of time. Yeah. Another common mistake is sometimes people just forget to exclude certain experiments, some existing run experiments from the experiment they're going to run. I see. So that it, might create some collisions between experiments. So that's why that layer uh -huh. is a very important feature we actually be, uh, use a lot because uh -huh. by using layer, you can uh, set up mutually exclusive experiments within the layer yeah. so that they are not, not to you know, contaminate with each other. Yeah, so I think overlapping experiences are okay, but it's only if you know that. Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. So be careful. It's okay for, for users to be exposed to any of the combinations, yeah. but some experiments 
guys they don't all work well together. Yeah, exactly. So as a, from a user experience. From point. a user experience, exactly. So, so one common uh, example people always use is if we run experiments to change the button from going green to red, mm -hmm. and another experiment change the button from green to blue. Uh -huh. And if you have these two experiments all together, uh -huh. it's going to be really tricky for the user. The user might see at one time they see green and then uh, see red. At one time they actually see, see blue. That's that's probably covers the major mistakes we see in the design part. A lot of things can go wrong, but I think we don't need to be scared. In the end, it's actually about engineering. If you if you go to remember how you uh, do uh, experiments in labs, you have to design the experiment well to prove or disprove your uh, hypothesis. If you really think hard about this, then you can avoid most of the mistakes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. All right, so the other category. So before we get into the measurement part, I think in order to measure something, right, you need to have the data to begin with. So common mistake we see is engineers didn't really pay enough attention to the logging piece. So which means, for example, you know, this is not only for experiments per se, but it's actually important. For, <laughs> it's not directly for experiments per se, yeah. because if you have a new feature, company new, new feature, yeah. you log new events for the new feature, it's not applicable to the existing feature anyway. Yeah. However, it's important for you to debug later if the result is not moving in a direction you expected. Yeah. So that you know, okay, maybe if I lock the funnel of the new feature, I know which part has a big drop off, which was unexpected. Yeah. Another common mistake, which is more nuanced, is sometimes when you have a new feature, you might break. Yeah. the existing log logging system without noticing them. Uh -huh. So that's why it's very important to do dog fooding. Yeah. Not only on the feature itself, but also on the lo lo logging piece. Yeah. I remember that when I first started uh, Facebook, uh, the team was uh, quite well at executing and building new features, yeah. but they didn't pay too much attention on logging. They realized most of the stuff we want to know, we couldn't. Yeah, exactly. So we had to spend a lot of uh, a lot of sessions to fix the logging. And yeah, I cannot believe how many bugs <laughs> we, we got in those sessions. Within an hour, we fixed tons of uh, logging mistakes. Yeah, exactly. So logging is very important, very crucial. Once you get all the logging properly set up, and then now after a certain amount of time, which you predetermined before the experience starts, it's time to look at the result, right? So that's because a very nice post result feature where you can look at all the metrics at, the, at, at one go. However, I see some mistakes people you really make in this measurement part is one, they didn't choose the launch criteria before launch the feature. Oh. <laughs> but rather they cherry pick the metrics that yeah. makes the a launch story. look good. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very easy to come up with a story afterwards and uh, be logical, consistent. Exactly. And uh, you can basically justify anything. And exactly. You can look at the same uh, data uh, to justify a launch or justify a non-launch. Yes. Uh, it's easy to come up with multiple stories. So it's important to yeah, so decide that before. Exactly. Beforehand. Also, uh, it helps you to decide on the uh, sample size and the experimentation du duration as well. The discipline. Yeah, discipline, exactly. Yeah. And an another uh, common misconception is I can only launch a feature when my result is statistically significant. Mm -hmm. That's not always true. Yeah. It's because to me, experimentation launch decision is a uh, teamwork and Experimentation gives you one source of evidence yeah. of, the, of the hypothesis. And you might have other evidence. Yeah. It's sometimes because of the kind of strategic kind of reason why you need to launch this, this experiment. For example, this is going to be an important setup for the next step you want to implement for, for, for this product. Or it can be we have heard from the user all the time from the, you know, the quality of feedback. We think it's a very important thing to launch this kind of features, yep. even without such statistically significant movement. But we see, you know, it's directionally kind of, it's directionally positive. I think we still have enough confidence this might be a good change for, for the user. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, I see a lot of abuse of that. So oh, it's yes. better to go back to the discipline. If you know this is important, no matter the significance of the results, well, up and down of the results, then call it out before the experiment. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Do not 
you expect this to be green, and then it's not, and then you have to justify all we want it anyway, that is going to be a harder discussion, exactly. and that doesn't show you are just Exactly. So this pre-alignment is super, super important. Yeah. Uh, and another common mistake is called early picking problems. Mm -hmm. For folks who are familiar with statistics, all the metric movement are going to fluctuate uh, across the time. They have weekday, we, we, we can impact uh, all the time. So, you know, once you decide on the duration of the experiment beforehand, most time you don't want to make a call mm -hmm. before the experiment reach uh, the end of the d d duration. Yep. Uh, however, you know, right now has some text sequential testing, yeah. which can facilitate us making a decision, but it still yep. require us to make sure we understand what's the implication of that. Yeah, we have a sp sp sequential testing too. Maggie wrote a post. I think there are two things in early picking. Uh, one is uh, novelty effect, yeah, and exactly. you don't want to based on the novelty effect. And two is just just the nature of power. Exactly. Uh, uh, additional bias we introduce is if we can look at uh, a static positive or negative or, or insignificant equally, it's actually okay. Yeah. But people actually have the bias of just cherry picking the positive results. Yeah, exactly. So that actually changed the power. power. Exactly. Yeah. So we need to do the adjustment. Yes, totally. Yeah. An another, not a mistake, but I think one tip I to give folks when they report their experimentation result is really not only report the percentage of changes, because when you talk mm. about percentage in a vacuum, especially for folks who don't know what the baseline looks like, it's really hard for them oh, yeah. to picture. Uh -huh. Is this a very important change? Yeah. So for example, if you only run an experiment for let's say if Notion only run experiment for only the static employees who are using Notion, and then you see a 20% lift, oh, oh my God, it's great. But the thing is you only, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's only, you know, probably 30, 40 people there. So the, yep. the, in, the actual size is not, it's not that huge. Uh, yeah, I call out in my visualization video as well. Yeah. I always put the delta side by side with the absolute Exactly. Size. So it's, 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 very, it's very important to have that practice. Yep. And another common uh, mistake I think I've seen so far is really overreaction mm. to statistical significance results in irrelevant metrics. Oh. Because, you know, statistics have give us the convenience. To uh, click and dive. Uh, yeah, click and dive. You have so many metrics. You can look at all the metrics available in your ecosystem yeah. at one time. However, when you are looking at more and more metrics, the false positive rate is going to be way much higher than yeah. you expect before. Uh -huh. So either you have to do some corrections, FDR or, or something like that, or you just have to ignore them. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know, for example, if you make some changes on user education, flow, and then you see something weird changing the sign up. Mm. Unless you set up the experiment really in a, in a wrong way, mm. there's no way the, the, you know, the change you make downstream can affect a, a upstream. Mm. So in that sense, you just ignore that. I think the, the t two things. One is the, go back to the discipline, know what you're looking for yeah. and not. And the two, know the actual the statistics behind this. Exactly. Like it can be just uh, fast positive. And it happens, confidence interval, there is a percentage associated with it because random things can happen. Yes. Uh, but sometimes it's also maybe useful to use it as a curiosity, you know. Yeah, if exactly. something really unexpected happened, maybe there is a bug. Maybe there is a bug, exactly. Yeah. So that's why the example I gave is under the condition there yeah. was no, no bug yeah. that, that is irrelevant to experiments. Yeah, yes. so this is the kind of the art part of uh, exactly it's the yeah. art part. You yes. need to make decisions based on you know incomplete uh, data. You can no, never guarantee uh, certain things, but uh, okay, if you are confident enough that there is no bug, then yes. maybe choose to ignore is the better course of action. Yes, I think that summarizes the two big categories of mistakes. Wow, so many so mistakes. I know. <laughs> That's why I do think uh, analytics is a craft, yes. and uh, sometimes it's even taught as a printed model. Mm. Like, there is no textbook on this. Hopefully this video helps. But uh, the experiment, experiences are not derived by some formula. No. It's, it's what we observe in reality in working and supporting hundreds of experiments and see people making these mistakes mm -hmm. that we are able to summarize. Yeah, exactly. And also, you have to look at all the you know the setup and the re 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 results in the in the context. Yeah. Because every team, every product has 
has its own kind of decision making process, has its own unique metrics they want to look at, have their own their unique decision making workflow. So it's very important to keep that on mind too. So yes, the context is super, super important. Yeah. But yeah, I think that is that is why companies hire their own data scientists and pay them uh, salary uh, because yeah, exactly. yeah, they need to understand the business context. Maybe like that's this. why data science cannot be easily replaced by AI because you have to know the business context in order to make a decision. Okay, yeah, we should make uh, content about that as well. Yes. <laughs> let's do that. Let's okay. make that content. Cool. Another thing, actually, you know, Biostatic gave us a very convenient way for us to look at all the metrics. Uh, but sometimes uh, in a company which doesn't really have this luxury to have a platform Statistic, or even we have Statistic, but we probably sometimes we need to dig deeper into certain dimensions, which we haven't logged on Statistic yet, we need to do some offline analysis. That's actually takes a lot of data scientist time, yeah. as far as I can tell. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so thanks to Statistic. <laughs> it does speed you, up, Yeah, it does speed up our efficiency in reading experimentation result. Uh -huh. But the questions I always get from sometimes from the team and the reports is, for example, they have seen uh, a metric movement is, uh, is expected. Either uh, they are hoping this can be statistically significant, but it turns out it's not, or it went a you know, completely different direction. They want to dig deeper into why. It's always good to understand why certain movement is not moving as expected, and that might require some offline analysis mm -hmm. by looking at, for example, very common techniques we use to look at the metric movement by different cuts. Mm -hmm. We have different segments. However, I don't encourage every time you have a problem, you just want to cut every single dimension you can. Because one, every time you you look at the result by a certain dimension, you sacrifice power. Yeah. Because sample sizes become smaller yeah. and the real gonna be more noisy. Yeah. And secondly is every time you want to do this, you might want to have a clear hypothesis about why you want to look at this. Yeah. For example, it's not because I just want to look at this by region. Maybe your hypothesis should be maybe our product doesn't is not localized well enough. That's why we might see certain regions react differently than the other regions. That's why I want to dig into regions. Yeah. No, not because I have region, we have this log, that's what we're gonna look at everything altogether. Yeah, I think in Amazon, the WBR, the weekly business reviews, that's what uh, a lot of uh, data people do. Uh -huh. uh, leadership ask question why, and then they spend uh, a couple of days deep oh, dive no. into this. Oh no. Looking at different segments, looking at different factors, uh, components of that. Metric. Yeah, but sometimes, again, I think it has some other things to do with the data culture. Sometimes yeah. you just, as a data scientist, you have just to defend it in a way that saying, okay, I don't think this makes sense because it's for power and it's not worth our energy to, to dig deeper because there's no good hypothesis around it at this point. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's, been, it's, it's a good practice to ask the st stakeholder to defend the hypothesis with you. Yeah, exactly. Come up with the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, okay, I can look at the data, and if the data is this, then we uh, validate the hypothesis, or we choose a different course of action. Yeah. But if they cannot come up uh, with a hypothesis, be careful with the uh, ask. Exactly. Because people look for, there is a, a bias that I forgot the name, but people look for pat patterns. Yeah, pattern so, matching, yeah. Pattern matching. And uh, yeah, if you break down and you have a low sample, this moves up purely by noise, and you can st start uh, crafting stories. Exactly. Yeah, and that goes sense. back to the ch cherry picking problem yeah. we mentioned before yep. as well. Yeah. So that's why I think uh, offline analysis likely unavoidable, mm -hmm. especially sure. data science in this exp experimentation heavy teams. Mm -hmm. So one thing uh, we have done so far to streamline the process to make it easier and less painful uh, for data scientists is we have a kind of a notebook, a playbook, uh -huh. so that you know everything can be defined beforehand. You just need to change the experimentation name, change the metric name, and you just run the notebook and you can see the result very clearly. Yeah. And sometimes dashboard help. But like, sometimes yeah. that dashboard help. Yep. Too. Yeah. yeah, basic have tools to do the, uh, if you can fo uh, fo format a uh, template, exactly. then use the template, reuse the template. Exactly, yeah. Nice. All right. So thank you for all the uh, pragmatic experiences of uh, experiments. Of course. And I hope this will help many people to uh, avoid potential mistakes. Yeah, I hope so too. Hope you find it helpful. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.